Hello, good evening, everybody. <coughs> so the talk will be about business model generation, business model canvas, and I will try to explain what we will do today. Before that, you have the best greetings from Alex. He was flying today to Oslo, and he will give the same talk as we will have today. It's not synchronized at the minute, but <laughs> not for it. Okay, the question was at the time, and it's still for us, to how to design innovative business model. Design business model. Before to explain what I will do today, uh, some example. I will ask you to recognize the company be, uh, behind those founders. Which one? Which company? Oh, ready? Google. This one? Easy Jet. Easy Jet. Good. And this one? I choose a Swiss one. <laughs> No idea? Swatch. Swatch. Correct. <clears throat> the question is what they have in common. What those <clears throat> examples have in common. And I will suggest three answers. So the first one is they didn't focus only on product innovation, on technology innovation. They empowered this innovation through something else, what we call the business model. The second one. They didn't just copy existing business model. They innovate. They create some new business models. Even if they have been inspired by some existing one. You could consider that Google has been inspired by the television model. Because you don't pay for watching television, there are some others like advertisers. And finally, it's impossible to prove a good idea before. After a couple of years, it's easy to, for us to say, wow, wow, Swatch, Google, EasyJet, we are successful. But when you have this idea and when you go, you have to take some risk. This is the entrepreneurial aspects of this game. OK, based on those three ones, we develop a vision that I will try to share with you tonight. And we think that we could be inspired by designers, such as architects. And I will come back with this analogy in a few moments. Why? Because they use some visual tools. They use some prototyping techniques. And they use some testing or experimenting techniques. And so based on those three ones, I suggest you to pass those, two, those three uh, topics if you want. The first one I will try to share with you the idea on the business model canvas. Most of you maybe know the, the concept. Second, I will try to show you how is it possible to use some design thinking techniques such as prototyping, customer insight for creating business models, which is not a decision making process. We will try to explain <laughs> that at that time. And finally, very shortly, I will try to show how is it possible to merge the business model canvas for describing a, or designing a business model with the lean startup movement. Okay. I have no idea about your expectation. It's clear. Too many people here. My expectation is to avoid this phenomena, correct? I uh, know, and especially because we have some beginners in the room. I chat with some people. We have no idea about the business model canvas, but we have also experts in the rooms. So my expectation is to avoid this phenomena. So it means that I will ask you to do something in a few moments. So I will use a color code. When it's <coughs> blue, I will present something. When it's uh, yellow, I will illustrate with some kind of business model innovation. And finally, when it's green, it's time to wake up. I will ask you to do something or to think and to say something. OK, that's clear. When it's read, this kind of lesson. Do you hear me at the hand? OK, good. Let's go. Start first with what's a business model. Before that, green. So my question for you, I come from Switzerland. We drink a lot of coffee. The question for you is this one. 10 years ago, roughly, we spent, a, a Swiss family used to spend 100 Swiss francs for drinking coffee at home for one year. You have an idea? No. In 2014, 10 years later, how much you can s we spend for coffee for one Swiss family per year? A number? 500. 2,000. Yeah, are you crazy? <laughs> OK, we will keep 500. So it means between six and eight times more. It's not because of George Clooney. 
We don't drink more coffee than 10 years ago, but we spend much more because of Nespresso. My question now is, you, it means that you have a definition of what you consider is a business model. So take two minutes with your neighbor, and I will ask in two minutes, what's your vision of what's a business model? Generic one, so general one. What's a business model? Your vision, your definition of a business model. Two minutes with your neighbors with your di direct neighbor. Okay, Mario and uh, Robin will take three definitions. Okay, one, first. It's the way uh, business structures, it's... Uh, it's the business structure... It's products and services to make money. For selling product, for making money. A second one. Responding the market demand. Responding to marketing. Market demand. Mark. And that's it. Okay. Next one. Uh, we have the experience on the sales of the machine at a loss. On the next on no, the no, not coffee. machine. It's a business model in general. Okay. The experience. Experience. Okay. Wait a minute. Here we have this phenomena. Why? Uh, I, we pick up only three definitions. And we have three different visions. Marketing uh, or making money with product and find the experience there. And if in the room we had accounting people, and I will have them, what's a PNL? Everybody shared the same vision. It's not true, and it was not true for the business model. So there's a reason why we thought at that time with Alec that it could be nice to have a common language for defining a business model. We wanted to have three characteristics. First, simple. I put that a baby, a baby, but in fact is the entrepreneur, the founder of the company, or the CEO of the company. They don't like sophistication, they don't like business, they prefer to speak about product or good idea, great ideas, dream, vision, and so on. Second, we wanted to have something we call that holistic, means covering different aspects of the company, not only marketing, not only revenue model, not only customer experience or customer relationship, something more global. But we wanted also to have all the pieces uh, where each piece could fit together. Okay, so I will try to show you. That. And third one, we <coughs> wanted to have something visual, something that you can use in front of you for designing a business model. And so we came with this uh, business model canvas. For some of you, the expert in the room, in, it will be uh, kind of refreshing. And for the other ones, you will discover this model in two minutes. This is the business model canvas. It's just what Beth and Carl will need to craft a powerful business model, and it can do the same for you. Let's dive in and see how it works. There are nine essential building blocks that make up any business model. When you get all nine blocks working together, you'll have answered the fundamental questions any business model must solve. We'll start here with customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. Channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. The customer relationships outline the types of relationships you're establishing with your customers and how you're acquiring and retaining them. Pricing mechanisms through which your business model captures value are documented under revenue streams. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model, so you can describe the infrastructure you need to create, deliver, and capture value. The key activities show which things you need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't own all key resources yourself, nor will you perform all key activities. And once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. Any business model can be mapped this way. Okay, so this is the refreshing aspect of, who knows the canvas? Okay, out of the room. So I will illustrate this canvas with a short example of company that you know, I think. So the idea, and this is the visual <coughs> aspect, this is a canvas, you can use big one, small one, and the idea is to use past it, to put them somewhere, to discuss, to change, and to create, design a business model or renovate a business model if you have already one. Okay, I will choose this company, Airbnb, who knows? 
okay? And very briefly, I will tell you the story of this company. It started like this one. Joe Gibia and uh, Brian Chesky earn $1,000 putting this mattress in their apartment in one week. Why? Because some attendees to an international conference wanted to live with the local without to go to the auto. It was the first idea, and so they say, eh, we could create a small business with this activity. If we use a canvas for creating this business, we will use, and I will visit some pieces of this uh, uh, business model. The first one is, the first value proposition is they offer a low price accommodation to low income travelers. This is the first uh, value proposition and the first customer segment. They target those customers. The second part of the business model, which is the second value proposition is, okay, it will be possible to rent your house if you are a house with space space. Okay, two pieces. At that time, they decided to reach the customers to a distribution channel, mainly two ones. First, the conference website, the conference organizers' website, and second, some classified hats website that <coughs> were available on the market. It was the first idea. And they had something else on the left-hand side. We will, start. we will see that later. But they had no revenue model, no way of generating money. Why? Because Joe was one of them here, and so for him it was fine. And they have seen many travelers coming and many owners coming, and they say, oh, it's perfect, I could generate money for myself, maybe roughly 1,000 per week. Oh, <laughs> But it's not a true business, if you want, because no revenue came in the pocket of this company by itself. So at that time, another partner came, Nathan came, and he said, we will change a little bit this business model, and we will transform that in an open peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for people traveling to stay anywhere around the world, and not only in California. And so they took the same parts of the value proposition, but they put one more, which was a strong reservation mechanism between the two kind of customers or the two parts of the value proposition, exactly as TripAdvisor or Booking.com, Expedia. <coughs> they change the distribution channel. They say, okay, we will have our own website and we will use also some social media, social networks and YouTube and so on for reaching the customers. <coughs> and here, what we call the customer relationship, they say, okay, we will try to animate a community of travelers and owners. Okay, and so they put some means for having a kind of rela uh, emotional relationship with their customers, the two kind of customers. And they had a strong revenue model, so they were able to generate revenue coming from both first the travelers, between six and nine percent, and three percent coming from the reservation, but by the owners. So two flows, two streams, two revenue streams. And they adopted, uh, they adopted the left-hand side of this market. They say, okay, we need to have some resources to be able to offer this value proposition to the customers. And so they say, okay, we need to have an infrastructure, IT infrastructure. We need to have the listings of objects, many objects through the world. And we need to have talented people, experts in hospitality management, destination management, tourism. Talented people. When you have a resource, when you have something, you can do something. This is the key activities. And when you have a double-sided market with two different value propositions and a kind of matching mechanisms, wow, you have invited uh, the media? Or? Yes. <laughs> okay, you can do, and most of the time you have to do three kind of things. You have to manage an infrastructure, here mainly IT infrastructure. You have to manage and to do something related to the service providing. And finally, you have to do something which is, which is related to the customer care. Three kinds of activity, main activities. Some of those activities, you need to have some partners because you are all too small or you are not an expert in this field. And for example, in their case, they never 
dealt with the payment process by itself. So they had some uh, partnership with PayPal and some credit card issuer. But they, for example, they had also some strong, recently, they had some strong partnership with some photographers to put value on, on some of their listings, and the costs are mainly related to, the, to those activities. This is roughly the business model they had. Very briefly, a couple of numbers to show that in four or five years they were quite successful. Here is the number of nights from two to, uh, 2010 to 2012. Okay, good. Uh, progression. Here is the number of listings, number of objects, and now they are reaching between five and six hundred thousand. Aha, here's something uh, quite interesting. This is a coverage of New York in 2008. Three years later, this is the coverage of New York. And what's interesting is one of those pieces, one, one of those apartments, if you want, in average earned fifteen hundred dollars per month because of Airbnb. So it's quite disruptive in a way. What was the reaction of the incumbents? Hotels, official uh, bed and breakfast. What was the first reaction they had? They said, well, okay. Individuals, um, small people, small companies. And no, they say, oh, 1,500 in average dollars per month. It's a ton of money when you see the number of apartments they have. And so the first reaction after a couple of years was go to the core. Okay? It's a traditional way of competing. You say, not fair. Security regulation, licensing regulation, blah, blah, and so on. They went to the core. Sometimes they won, sometimes Airbnb won. It's not decided yet, so sometimes. And it's true for some other cities, Paris, Amsterdam. And you have seen recently, it's also true for Uber, which is the same consumption, collaborative consumption with cars, car sharing. Okay, green, time to wake up. And I will come back with my Nespresso example, okay? So, Nespresso is two things. You mentioned the machine and the capsules. And I will ask you to design the business model of Nespresso. But this time using a canvas. You will receive a canvas, one for two or three people. And I will ask you to design the business model because most of you, you say, oh, I know Nespresso. So you are able to design the business model of Nespresso. <laughs> you have to do, this, do, to do this in six minutes. Thank you. So the main value proposition was to offer the best possible coffee, as good as the coffee in the best cafe in Roma. It was the main idea, the dream of Eric Faf a long time ago. We have two parts. The first one is the machine in this value proposition. We change two kinds of customers, family at home, but also businesses. At the beginning, they had only one. But maybe you have seen some t two different kinds of capsules, the flat one and the conic one. At the beginning, they had only the conic one. But the employers have seen that sometimes, never in UK, but the employee <laughs> take the capsules, go home, and they use the capsule of the office in their machine. So they, those gentlemen here, the businesses, ask them to change a little bit the business model. And that's the reason why they have two main segments. Okay, the channel initially for the machine was the retailers, department stores. Okay, and the revenue model is the revenue coming from the sales of those machines. But since the beginning, the big part of this money coming from the machine is for the machine manufacturers company. Because Nestle, which is a food company, never manufactured the machine so far. It will be changing a little bit, but at that time it was not the case. So the machine manufacturing, big names, Bosch in Germany, Tumix in Switzerland, Moulinex in France, and so on. Okay, we have a second part in this value proposition. We have the capsules. And we have seen that most of the revenue comes from the capsule. Okay, and in this case, they use what we call a multi-channel approach for the customers. The way of reaching the customers, they use initially, the, it was a mail order company. It was possible to use the call centers for reaching them. A couple of years later, they introduced a website, Nespresso.com. And much more recently, 
they have also, they came with some Nespresso stores in the big cities, roughly, I think, 150 cities in the world. Very luxurious stores for selling Nespresso capsules, machine, and all the merchandising uh, stuff. So the revenue coming from this activity is the revenue, which is a recurrent revenue, huge one. You will see the number in a few moments. And the customer relationship, I put here the Nespresso Club, because it's a way to keeping the customers. But the, the real way for keeping the customer, if you buy an Nespresso machine, you have to buy the capsules because of this technology they have used. So it means that it's almost impossible to use some other capsule. Because they have something for protecting their IP, intellectual property, which are the, the, the patterns they have. They have roughly 250 patterns on the capsule, the machine, and so on. Recently, some of those patterns ended. That's the reason why some competitors came with capsules that you, you can put inside the same machine. They are not happy with this one. So what was the first reaction of Nespresso? Going to the call. Not fair. OK. And so they have, other, some, they have also the brand. Clooney is one of them. It's clearly an asset they have, if you want. The, the Nespresso va brand is highly valued. And the facilities, why? Because they produce millions of capsules per day, billion per year, and only in Switzerland. The capsules are produced in Switzerland, and they are sent it in the world. So it means in the main processes, the main key activities, they have this marketing activity to promote, and you have seen this clearly in, in many airports in the world. You have the production, so it means you have to produce those capsules, not the machine, but the capsules and the distribution to bring those capsules from Switzerland in different countries in the world, 140 uh, countries, I think. And the costs are mainly related to those three activities. This is uh, roughly the business model of Nespresso. Yes? So Nespresso is vertically integrated on its production Okay, uh, no, because uh, those ones, the retailers, are some partners. So it's the de department stores and groceries and this kind of thing. But only for the machine, they are not allowed to sell coffee. And for the coffee, they, ho they use their own distribution channel. So like the store, the website, the call centers, and so on. That's all. In this sense, they are not integrated with them. It's just a partnership they have for selling, which is the distribution channel. And they have also the access to the coffee because that is, it was the main job of Nestle. They, they know how to reach the coffee growers and so on. Okay, with this business model, they changed the world of espresso, at least in Switzerland and many different countries, I'm sure in the UK also. But here, something which is interesting. In, uh, here, the numbers first, growth is 30%. And the annual revenue is roughly five billions with one product line, only the capsules. So it's huge. But when they started, a couple of years later, they almost disappeared. It was like a startup inside the Nestle configuration or constellation, and they almost disappeared. And here, a good lesson. They had exactly the same product. The patterns, they already had everything. The same machine, the same capsule. Since the beginning, they have this partnership with the machine manufacturers. But you know, Nestle is what we call a business-to-business -business company. You don't have normally some Nestle stores or shops. So it means that Nestle deliver to retail, groceries, retail stores, department stores, and so on. And they sell to the customers. Okay, and so they say, we will do the same. We, will done, we won't change our business model. So we will use as the, mo as the main uh, distribution channels, the retailers, but also they thought at that time that it could be possible to have a joint venture with the machine manufacturer. You sell your machine, you sell my coffee, by the way. And with this model, which is a business to business to consumer, they almost failed. A new CEO came, Gaia, and he said, OK, we will change the game, and we will come with the model you have in front of you. We will try to reach the customers directly with our own channel. And with this model, we have seen the number 5 billion per year this year, uh, last year. And so we will keep in mind the message that I, what I would like to have at the beginning is 
the right business model can be the difference between the success and failure for the same product, same product innovation, same service innovation, same technology innovation. Okay. You remember I say, okay, we have beginners and know you have seen how to at least design an existing model, but we have also some experts. And I will come here with something we discovered a little bit later. When the, the business model <coughs> canvas has been adopted, we have seen that most of the people use this canvas as a kind of checklist. <coughs> they put that somewhere and they say, okay, I have to think to the distribution. What's the distribution channel? And then next, the next one, uh, what kind of customer relationship I would like to maintain with the customers? And I think it's not true. It's not the best way of doing. Because we are convinced that a business model tells a story about your business. So it means that normally all the different pieces has to fit together. If you have this in idea in mind, it's not enough to consider that the canvas is the, the objective, it just puts some post-it somewhere. You have to put some post-it somewhere and each of those post-it normally have to be related. I will give you an analogy. If you design a house, you could put the bedroom here, the kitchen there, the living room here, and it won't change for the next 20 years. But if you design an airplane, you have the wings, you have the different pieces, and you have to describe those pieces. But you have also to describe the behavior, the dynamics of the plane. So it means that you have to show that if you push this on the ref and, and on left or right, you will move those two parts. If you push and pull, you will move those two parts. And if you use a pedal, you, you, will, you will use this one. And engineers, as a language for describing this behavior, this equation, we don't have. And so that's the reason why we come with what we call some best practices. And, what, and I will mention two of them. The first one is color coding. It could be better to color code some of your pieces, some of your post-it or some of your components or blocks in, in the canvas, just to show that they are related. Here, for example, we could use, with the Airbnb model, we could say, okay, what's its red? It's related to the fine house somewhere. And if it's blue, it's related when I try to push my apartment somewhere. That's the first. But it's not enough because you don't know exactly the relationship between those ones. So the next one could be, it could be interesting to link, but visually link the different components. And here, again, in the, uh, on, in the Airbnb model, we could say, uh, hey, we could say, okay, this value proposition is for this kind of customers and they will generate this uh, revenue. We have another one, so it means that it's possible to generate a revenue coming from this value proposition by this kind of customers, first. Second, we could maybe show that it's because you have a lot of owners that it's attractive for the travelers traveling anywhere in the, around the world. But it's also because we have a lot of travelers that this value proposition has a great value, a high value for this kind of customers. This is the double-sided aspect of this business model. And then after you can show what kind of activities you need to be able to operate this matching activity. Okay, then you can show what kind of resources you need to be able to operate this uh, infrastructure management <coughs> or customer care. And you can also show that some partners like the payment are necessary to do and to operate this uh, service providing and it has a cost and so on. And so you, you can continue, you can show the dynamic. And this dynamics is quite interesting. For example, if you have to pitch the story, pitch a business model, you can, if you have a good understanding of your story, it will be easier for you to uh, present your business model to some external people. For example, in the case of Nespresso, I could ask you to color code and relate the different components which are concerned only by the post distribution, not the machine. So you have the model in front of you. This is the question for you. But we have no time, so it's a norm work. So you have to go back with this one, and tonight you have to draw the different flows you have in this business model. Okay, second part. You remember I said we also need to have some design 
thinking techniques for creating a business model. Why? Because I'm convinced that designing a business model is not deciding a business. It's not only deciding a business model. What's the difference? Most of the time, and many people, even in good and great business school, have been trained for deciding. You know a lot of models for deciding. But deciding, you have decided that you have some alternatives, it's quite easy, and the difficult part of the job is to choose the best one. But it's for an entrepreneur, it's not the case, because it, you don't copy existing business model. You have not here three business models and say, okay, I have a dream to sell this product, I will choose this one. No, no, you will change something. You will choose a new distribution channel, make a partner's acquired resource. So the difference between both is, for the decision making, you have the different alternatives and you try to choose the best one. And you have some models for doing it, you have some criterion for deciding. And I think creating something is different. You have to open the game. You have to come with the alternatives. And you say, oh, this one could be interesting. This one could be interesting. And then afterwards, second step, you will say, oh, it seemed that case better. OK, so you will choose this one. And you will come back to a deciding process. And so it means that we need to be trained for designing and not only for designing. Uh, deciding. And so with French entrepreneurs, we have to be trained to prototype, to come with some alternatives before deciding I will choose this business model. So what we have in our toolbox, we have many different techniques, which are the techniques that designers or architects could know. And we are less familiar with those techniques. And two of them is first, rapid prototyping. Second is user observation or user or customer insight. OK, the first one is prototyping. What does it mean, prototyping? In business, most of the time, when you speak about prototyping, you show something and you say, no, I would like to this one a little bit bigger, transparent. We, you come with this one, you say, perfect. For an architect, it's not this one. For an architect, he come with something. You say, I like, I, no, I don't like. And next time, you come with something which is completely different. And if you have been trained in deciding, you say, no, no, stop. Last week, we decided that it will have this shape transparent and not blank and big. And you say, oh, oh yes, yeah, but tell me why you don't like this one. Because prototyping is not a way of refining. It's a way of coming with new alternatives. I will just show you. You know this, uh, this gentleman here? He has designed this building. Oh, yes. OK, Guggenheim Museum, Bilbao. OK, it's Frank Gehry, very famous architect. When an architect works and designs a building, he will use different prototypes, many prototypes. In this case, maybe 50, 60 different prototypes. And he will use some techniques, sketching first, and then he use some plans. And he, use, he will use some mock-ups, small one, big one, different size, different color, different shapes, and so on. And at the end, he will decide among those ones which one he will adapt for creating and for designing and for building the building. And Frank Gehry has built this uh, business school in Cleveland. And he has been observed by uh, faculty members in, in management. And they have seen that an architect doesn't work as a business guy. And we could maybe influence by their way of, wo of working, coming with different alternatives. <coughs> Okay, uh, so what does it mean for us? It means that when we have one ID, it could be interesting to come with not necessarily 100 IDs, but maybe two, three, four of them. And then afterwards saying, oh, it seems that this one is better than the first I had before. And this process for opening the game, so me coming with different prototypes of your business model using the canvas, is very difficult. Why? If you are a young entrepreneur, you are so convinced that your product is good that you are fixed on your business model very quickly and you don't like to change. And if you are the CEO of a big company, you will see some of them later, they say one idea is good because when you have one idea, one business model, by definition is the best one. But if you have three ideas, you have to throw away two of your good ideas. They don't like to do it. And I will here show you how we have using these techniques, prototyping techniques, in our case. 
when we have decided to write this book in 2008, we have this question. I have this question for you. You have an idea of how many new books in management are published every year on the US market? 10,000. It's roughly this number is between 11, maybe more new books. So it means that roughly you have 1 billion business books in the world. And we say, okay, we are, we come from a small university, Lausanne, you don't know maybe where it is located, so it's not a huge, a big name. And so we said, okay, we have to come with something else. And we use our canvas for creating eight different prototypes. The first one clearly is the regular one, the usual one. You write a manuscript, you send to the publisher, you are waiting for the, re the answers and you decide uh, to sign or not. We tested many different of them. And test it means, for example, that if you don't have a publisher, if you decide to do it yourself or to, you, to have an online book, a customer, it means if you don't have a publisher, it's almost impossible to reach the libraries or the bookstores or the airport bookstore. So you have to find some other channel. And you know that if you have an online channel, it's quite easy to create, but it's not easy to be aware that you exist somewhere. Okay, so we decided, and finally we decided to come on this model, what we call a co-created book. So we said in 2000, hey, we will write a book. Okay, and so we create a website here, Business Model Innovation App. You can come, you will see each chapter every two, three weeks, and you will be able to comment those chapters. So it, at that time, it created the bus, or in a, in a sense, but we tested this model. And we collected maybe 1,500 comments that we took into consideration for writing the second version, and then the end we write. But it's not finished yet, and I will for jump now on the second techniques we could use for designing, and then I, I will come back and I will tell you the end of the story. Customer insight is a second technique. When you design, when you design a business model, this part, what we call the value proposition, is quite key in this design, is central in this uh, business model design. And if you want to design a great value proposition, you need to have a good understanding of your customers. Why? Because uh, if you have a good understanding of those customers, it could be good to create a value proposition which is a good fit for having this meeting between the customers and your product or your service, your offering. Okay, but how to define customer centricity? It's not so easy because if you just ask him what he wants, most of the time he doesn't want, he doesn't know. Okay, so, and here we have this idea to look a little bit how the designers work, architect and so on, and I will use here a small message coming from this gentleman. You know him, French in the room? No, Philip Stark. It's a designer, it's architect, and so on. This video that you will see here is quite funny for the we two reasons. Very short, one minute. I took one minute. It's a re because first, this guy is quite funny. Second, his French is worse than mine. There is people like me who try to deserve to exist and who are so ashamed to make this useless job, who try to do it in other way. And they, they, they try, I try to, to, to not make the object for the object, but for the result, for the proof profit for the human being, the person who will use it. If we take the toothbrush, if uh, I, I don't think about the toothbrush, I think what will be the effect of the toothbrush in the mouth. And to understand what will be the effect of the toothbrush in the mouth, I must imagine who owns this mouth. What is the life of the owner of this mouth? In what society this guy live? What civilization? Okay, and so on. And first, what does it mean, who owns this mouse? So it means that, okay, great, but if you don't have designers like him, you need to do something else. So it means that you have to project yourself in the mind of your customers, in a way, to understand who has this mount and who is he, and so on. And here, we use a technique called jobs to be done, because we say, okay, if, we, if you want to design a good value proposition, you have a kind of mirror effect here 
because if you have a good understanding of your customer, it could be maybe easier to have the good fit between the value proposition and the customer segment you are targeting. And so we use some techniques, which is well known in, in the business world, in you know, innovation, for example, jobs to be done, marketing, and so on. And we came with a new canvas. But this canvas is an add-on one. It's a kind of zoom in. You open the box of the value proposition, and you zoom in on this one. So you want to design here. And so you will open those two boxes in a new canvas. OK, here, boom. But this canvas has a property. It's not a pure design one, because on the left, on the right hand side for you, here, you don't design, you observe the customers, or you make some assumptions, some hypothesis on your customer. You say, okay, what is job or her job? What are the pains, the main pains for, um, for them? What are the main gains? And based on this observation, you start to design a value proposition. You try to come with the right features, corresponding to the job he has to do or she has to do, and you try to relieve the pain and increase the gain. And with this kind of balance, you try to build your value proposition or your value propositions if you have different kind of customers. But it's not an independent framework or an independent canvas. It's something like a back and forth mechanism between the big one, which is the one you have used a couple of uh, with Nespresso, and this idea that, okay, you zoom in, you zoom out, you zoom in, you zoom out, in this prototyping activity when you are starting to design a business model. Finally, the third section, the third part of this talk, is related to the model testing. And we have observed that there are many different reasons why a business model could fail. of this type of failure are the infamous Segway, a personal transportation device, the Apple Newton, an early PDA, or Flow TV, a portable device by Qualcomm that comes with a mobile TV service. All three examples were very expensive flops, and one cost over a billion dollars. Unfortunately, your business model can fail even when you have a great value proposition that helps your customers get a job done that's relevant to them. Type two occurs when your business model design is flawed. For example, you're guaranteed to fail when your costs to acquire customers, so-called customer acquisition costs, are higher than what you can earn from them directly or indirectly over time. This is called their customer lifetime value. Here's a different example, a real world case. The now bankrupt American company Kodak used to earn the lion's share of their income from high margin film for cameras and employed 145,000 workers at their peak. Despite helping invent and commercialize the first digital camera back in 1975, they failed to come up with a business model design for digital cameras that would compensate for the evaporating revenues from selling film. Their new digital business model was fundamentally flawed. Type three. Now let's assume you have a great value proposition. You're solving a relevant customer job, and you have a sound business model design, you can still fail. This third type of failure is based on external threats emerging from the business model environment. Your competitors might offer a similar value proposition at a substantially lower price because they have a business model with different economics. Your customers might be interested in your value proposition, but they might think you're not sufficiently environmentally friendly. New technology innovations might undermine your business model or a stock market crash might dry up your funding. Here is an example, Google TV. Uh, <coughs> This uh, device has been created by Logitech. You know this company? You remember the mouses and the mice? Uh, and they had a project a, a couple of years ago to create a kind of setup box, if you want, to use the, your television screen as the main 
window on the internet, television, uh, movie on demand, and so on. And they make a great partnership with Google TV, big name, okay? And they create something. They are good engineer, so they do, and they did everything. They designed the, de the device, they manufactured 50 million devices, they write the, the software, they signed a contract for the content and so on. And they discontinue after a couple of months. How much they spend for a small company, it's not a big one, Logitech, a sweet company. They spend 100 million. They lost 100 million. And here's the quote from the founder of this company, Daniel Borrell, and he told, okay, you wake up suddenly with projections, numbers, that are false, in a world where you don't see your customers anymore. Because you trust the consulting firm, the data firm, the survey, second in and information, you don't have the contact with your customers. You lost the contact with your customers. And it happens a lot of time, even for a small startup, because they say, I s they are so convinced. It's not necessary to ask them. I know what they want. Okay, so that's the idea. And the customer development process is in a way based on this idea. When inside the building, so it means when you are creating your business model, your business model is only a set of hypotheses. And you have to check those hypotheses. And C. Blank, which is a, an entrepreneur in the Silicon Valley, but also author of two well-known books, say there is no fact inside. You have to go out very quickly at the beginning of the process for testing those hypotheses. And so it means at the beginning you test your hypothesis. Here you set a good business model. If you see that your customers are not ready to go with you and to buy or to uh, be engaged with you, you change your business model, you pivot, you transfer something before to decide, okay, no, it seems that it's mature enough and you can execute your business model, you can launch and so on. So it means what do you need in your business, in your toolbox? Not only for prototyping, customer insight, you need to have some tools and we have seen some of them at the beginning in your video, uh, call for action, landing page, A-B testing, ad tracking, innovation gains, free sales, fake sales, minimum viable product. There are some techniques for doing it, but we need to use this kind of techniques. Here, a short interview of, T of Steve Blank and he will try to explain you that uh, very shortly. For entrepreneurs, as smart as you are, on day one, all you have is one hour. It would be 40 minutes. <laughs> it's a religious organization. But you're betting on your vision and your, you see things others don't. But you know, we now know over history, about 95% of the time, you don't have a vision, you're actually hallucinating. So is it possible to kind of eliminate that waste of time and energy to find out only later that you were wrong? And so what we propose is you take your hypotheses, you actually break down your vision into this business model canvas, and now get it out of the building in a fairly formal way, using something we call the customer development process, to test every one of those hypotheses. And what we'll find is, you know what, as smart as we were, we're not smarter than the collective intelligence of our customers. Okay, so I will uh, just present you the end of the story for the books because we use these techniques in 2008. You remember that we choose this model, okay, this model co-created book and with a couple of partners. But we are also in, we were at that time also in the business model activity if you want. And we knew that, for example, the Dell model, hey, you buy your computer, you pay and you will receive it three weeks later. Oh, it's a good test. Okay. So we say, okay, based on what people say and what people do are two different things, it could be interesting to test if they are ready to buy this book and to see if we could diffuse and distribute. So we adopted this technique. You have to pay to come on this app. Though the 500 people who came for receiving this chapter, they had to pay. At the beginning, we asked them $24. We were you know, shy. And then at the end, we have them to pay $250. For a book, at the end, it will be only $30. And we have seen a couple of people paying much more than the value of the book. We say, wow, good test. Second test, we say, we will organize a workshop in Amsterdam 
and we say again, you can come if you are hung up or not. And we have seen 150 people coming in Amsterdam paying $1,000 just to attend a workshop where it was possible to show them a kind of draft of the book. And we say, okay, second test. They come for something which doesn't exist yet, so maybe it could be interesting. And based on this one, we decide to self-publish the book. 5,000 copies. We found a printer in uh, Amsterdam, uh, close Amsterdam. We created the website. We adopted a freemium model, so it means that the first 80 pages is for free. The book is roughly $30. We found a logistic company, and we say, okay, that's fine, go. It was good. We have seen many books uh, spread all over the world, but it was a nightmare. You know, sending books in 2008 by yourself is terrible. We had problems with customs, with postal offices, with, it was terrible. So we decided to change our channel. We say, okay, 5,000 with this one, it's not possible to continue. Sometimes Alex took the plane, go to New York with 20 books and meeting in an hotel just to give <laughs> those books. This was not possible, not realistic. So we changed the channel and we adopt it and we make an agreement with uh, Amazon.com. And you know, it's perfect. They know how to send book anywhere in the world. It was great. <laughs> and you know, okay. So, the problem, or the small problem, they took 40% of your revenue. Well, it's okay, but it's fair because it's good channel. And again, with this one, we sold, we changed the printer in Toronto, and we sold again roughly 10,000. And at that time, you have seen all the publishers coming. Hey, you want to come with me? And so we were in a good position to bargain with them, and we changed again the business model. We came back to the new one, the, the, the usual way of doing. And we signed with YD, and YD was very good for us because we were able to impose the color for this book, the flat format, very high, ultra right, and okay. <laughs> and <clears throat> we were also in the libraries, in the bookstores, in the airports. They were able to sign 30 translations, so it was a good move, but we, the fact that we tested this market with all readers, if you want, was a nice move for us. So we are at the end of this talk. We have seen this business model canvas. You have it in front of, don't forget, you have an homework. Okay, business model mechanics. Design thinking, I just mentioned two of them, prototyping, opening the games, and also having this idea of profiling your customers, trying to have a good fit between your value proposition and the, uh, and the, the customer profile, and this idea of uh, model testing with three lessons. First, the right business model make the difference, or could make the difference. Second, rapid prototyping, and don't fall in love with your first idea is the second message, and the third one, get outside the building very early in the process of creating or preparing the launch of your company. This is here. Question. <laughs>